Okay, so let me start the recording. Welcome everyone to this session, this last session in December of our communities. And tonight we have uh, Nils uh, Flagging that uh, is talking to us about, uh, let me say, changing our organization, accelerate the organization. What do you say? What can we summarize that? Excuse me, I didn't. No, how can we make a, a, a payoff for our, for our session, Nils? What can be a good payoff to introduce your talk? A good, a good way to introduce me. I've, I think I've been an agilist for 20 years already. and. Uh... I write about it and I talk about it, and I think we have not done enough. I think, Colado, you you agree with me. We have not we have not achieved the aim, right? Well, actually, I'm an agile since ten years, so I, I have a long journey for, to to achieve your results, frankly speaking. <laughs> but I'm not giving up. I will take you. Don't worry. I think I think we share the uh, the impatience and the let's say the the sense of urgency that something more is supposed to happen in the movement. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. True, true, true. That is why you created the meetup and why I write books and speak and, and do consulting and develop tools. Yeah, do you, do you want to say something What? why you invited me first, Corrado? Uh, as, as I said, actually, I met Niels uh, in a session that he led, uh, let me say, a couple of months ago, three months ago, something like that, in another community. And he was so engaging, frankly speaking, and also for, for myself, I would say really provocative because you are very good to create, uh, let me say, to incite, uh, to incept ideas that let you think about, it. but this is exactly what he said and what else. By the way, uh, Nils, just to give an idea, he's so good in his provocation that uh, when you have this conversation with Dave Snowden, uh, that comment one of your talks, something like a couple of weeks ago or something like that, this is just to tell you that the community that is following Nils is really at very high level. So it is a great honor for us to have Nils today as a, as a guest. So Great to be here. Great to be invited. Great to be speaking with all of you. So this session, let's we, we want to, to make it happen. It should take between 60 and 90 minutes, maximum, of course, 90 minutes. And um, Corrado, thank you for, for making this lovely introduction. Of course, the purpose of this session is not to provoke. It is to uh, invite and engage. And I want to plant the seed of doubt in your hearts, so to speak. And I think at last time, this seems to have worked with Corrado. So I hope this will work with you uh, guys. Uh, tonight as well. Um, and But I've been doing this for 20 years. So you might ask, okay, if, if he has done this provocation stuff for 20 years, how good can it be? It must be terrible, right? You might never have heard of it. I call it the beta codex, but at, when I started with it 20 years back, I was a financial um, manager at the time still. I was employed by a company in Brazil uh, as a financial controller or finance manager. And in our community at the time, this con concept called Beyond Budgeting uh, was uh, created. Maybe you've heard of it. It's still around. Uh, I think it's not as updated and contemporary as it should be, but it's, it, it still exists. So you can look it up, Beyond Budgeting. That is the, the thing I started working with. And 20 years ago, in 2003, 19 years ago, uh, almost almost 20 years ago, I, I wrote my first book about it. And since then, I've written... 10 books, 11 books already, and three in English. So you can look that up. And we have been developing it uh, for the whole time, which is a little bit different with Agile, I think. I, I would, or maybe it's the same thing as the Agile movement, depending on how you look at Agile. Uh, we could we could host, do a poll here asking, uh, do you think Agile or Scrum have evolved a lot over the last 20 years, or do you think they have not evolved much? Or do you, you might, we might ask also, do you think that Scrum and Agile have decreased in quality over time or increased in quality? In our movement or in my movement that I want to invite you to be part of or feel yourself part of uh, as of today, uh, the Beta Codex movement, I think we have made big progress. I think we have made big progress, but it's you for you to judge, not for me to judge, of course. But uh, we started off in beyond budgeting. So telling people you should not do budgeting, you should not do planning. It's like... Um, People in software development 20 years ago saying you should not do, you know, milestone planning. You should not do 
you know, uh, project planning, the classical sort, but you should work at sprints. And so we suggested something similarly radical to the finance and management community at the time and the performance management community and leadership community. Get rid of all the budgets, get rid of all the annual planning, get rid of the strategic planning even, get rid of the bonus systems, get rid of the individual targets, get rid of the plan actuals variance reporting. And you, you I'm not sure if you want to imagine or can imagine, but the, uh, that those suggestions were perceived as pretty radical. I myself, as a finance manager, when I, for the first time saw these papers about this topic and when i read the stuff about beyond budgeting at the time i thought this was fucking radical yeah so i thought this is crazy this is crazy stuff this can never work lunatics uh invented it but over time i got closer and closer to it and between 2003 and 2007 i was a director of the beyond budgeting movement so i um, we did the research. I did, you know, community work for Beyond Budgeting. We did meetups, of course, uh, less online, uh, more locally, and a little bit online at the time, but very little. And uh, and over the t over time, uh, we discovered that Beyond Budgeting may not have been the right brand for the whole thing. So we renamed the movement and we renamed the concept at the time. And maybe this is a starting point for today, because you might call what I will be talking about tonight, you might call it agile. That's fair. I can accept that. I can live with that. You may call it lean. You can call it, I mean, you can call it pink, pink woohoo, if you like it. I, 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 or you can call it anything you like. We call it beta or beta codex. Beta codex is the principles behind this, 12 principles. So. We call the 12 principles or laws, the laws, the constitution behind this, the beta codex. And, and this is a little bit different than in, in Agile, I think, not sure, Cordado uh, and, and, and everyone, if you agree with me. But uh, in the beta codex commun community, we are very, very aware that if this is the future, we have to talk about it, of course. I haven't said anything about it except the name, or su I suggested names, but we have to talk about if this makes sense. So. But what is really important in this topic tonight, I invite you to contemplate this, is that we also be, are aware of the enemy. The enemy we have to fight, the dragon that we must slash, so to speak, okay? And this is very, this is maybe the starting point of my invitation tonight. If we want to do more agile, if we want to get to agility, let's call it agility, right? Which is better, agility. If we want to have actual agility, we must slash the dragon of, well, how do you call it? I call it, I like to call it command and control. Does not sound, that doesn't sound sexy, right? Command and control. And it is not supposed to be sexy because it's evil. That's the evil dragon we need to slay, command and control. Of course, in software development, we, you, we, everybody like to say that, oh, the dragon we had to slash was waterfall. But now the dragon is different, right? Nobody talks, nobody defends waterfall anymore. But the dragon has crept out of its, uh, its mountain over and over again. It is trying to destroy us uh, all over again. I'm using metaphors here, of course, these are just metaphors. We haven't killed the dragon in Agile. We haven't slashed the dragon. The dragon has, or the, the evil model has been rebaptized, reinvented over and over again. And it's now called, let me provoke you a little bit here, safe, et cetera, agile scaling. Uh, the Spotify model, uh, what else is there out there? Evil, evil, you can write this into the chat. Evil alpha stuff, because I call, we call this model alpha. All right, the good model, we call it beta. The bad model, we call it alpha. Of course, I have to explain why it is bad, or if I'm just judging, I have to explain still, but... Uh, let me just offer to you this hypothesis. Alpha was okay once. It wasn't really good for people, but it was okay for, for the work, you know, to organize the work. But now it's actually bad and even evil. Huh? And the evil model, it's, it's like a zombie stuff. It, it comes creeping, it, it comes running back. Let's see if somebody has posted some, something about what's evil. Not yet, you haven't commented, but you might. Okay, ours, yes, okay, ours. I think that's the, that's part of the evil model. Anything else? Other stuff that you find is incredibly command and control, bureaucratic, centralizing, 
waterfall in new disguises, shit that's never going to work, but it's being sold in, in agile circles under new under fancy and kinky brand names. Nothing? Theory X. Yeah, okay. Theory X is, is, is the way we look at human beings. Maybe we get into talking. About. This is, I'm not trying to convince you here. I'm trying to, let, let me put it like this. Don't believe in anything that I say. What I'm doing, what I want to do is to make you contemplate the two different options that we have in organizing. We can organize software with development. You don't have to believe in what I'm saying, of course, but I will argue in this session, we can organize software development according to these principles or this model or this kind of structure and, and mindset, or we can use this uh, structure or mindset. Let me make a comparison so you understand why there are just two, why are there just two models? Couldn't there be three or five or six with different colors like Frédéric Lalou, uh, what Frédéric Lalou suggested? Oh, different, there is a ladder of improvement over time and within thousands of years, it's like it's like a TV show that I'm watching. Uh, it's like the, the golden circle running over and over and spinning, spinning again, we can evolve. Oh, no, no. I am trying to suggest to you, and don't believe what I'm saying, but I, I believe, honestly and firmly believe this is true. There are only two models that we can adopt, alpha or beta. Let me explain. By the way, write in the chat if you are living in a democracy. Write a yes if you write if you live currently live in a country or if you're currently in a country that has a democracy. It might be a not per, imperfect democracy. Uh, if you're in a democracy, if no, you can write an N or no. Okay, but if you live in a democracy, okay, some of you live in democracies. I guess good, good. If you live in the UK, I guess is a good answer. Yeah, okay, I think so. Yes, of course, democracy is never perfect. It's always shit, right? right? But democracy is like this model, it's democracy. Um, it's never perfect. That's why we call it beta. Uh, because one of, the, one of the great beta organizations 10 years ago was Google, I think. It's not a great beta organization anymore but 10 15 20 years ago google was a great example of such an organization and my ex-wife she worked at google and at some point she came back from from work and she said at google not just our products are always in beta our organization is always in beta it's always temporary always we have always questioning we never assume it's perfect we always have to battle bureaucracy and centralization we're always battling it so it's never it's per, in a perpetual state of madness and more decentralization and more empowerment and etc so that was the moment when i thought or when we thought my ex-wife we thought uh or now ex-wife uh beta could be a nice name for this model you know to to transport this that this is about perpetual state of imperfection perpetually changing perpetually involvement but like democracy with a firm set of principles. A democracy, for example, needs division of powers. Yeah, it needs uh, independent courts, uh, independent lawmakers, and so on. So in the independent police, and so on. The military must be separated from, from other, other powers of the state. So democracy needs a set of principles, yeah? What is the opposite of democracy? Well, I would say, globally speaking, it's authoritarianism, authoritarianism. Uh, authoritarianism can take many shitty forms. <laughs> Stalinism, fascism, among them, you know, dictatorships of all kinds, uh, authoritarian regimes, there are many, and they all have different flavors, but they are undemocratic. So this is my, don't believe what I'm saying, I'm just suggesting this to you, and I believe that this is true. There are not 50 shades of organizing. There are not 50 shades of managing or leadership. There are two shades. Of course, both these sides have many, many different expressions. For example, on this, in this part, you have terrible public sector organizations, ter terrible private organization, terrible, you know, all kinds of evil CEOs in this world, like Elon Musk and so on. Yeah. But they all have a certain set, set of principles. Alpha organizations are steered from the top. Steering is very important. Steering or commanding from the top down. Uh, in principle, the thinking is done at the top and the doing or execution or implementation is done at the bottom. We, over, over the decades, because this is obviously, it goes back to Frederick Taylor and Taylorism, right? And Frederick Taylor at this time, he envisioned this as a good thing because before 
Frederick Taylor and Taylorism and what he called scientific or what they at the time called scientific management. Before that, industrial organizations did a lot of laissez-faire, you know, no real structures, no standards. Organizations at the time of Frederick Taylor were terrible at setting standards. So in order to bring about standardization, standards, protocols, processes, order, cleansiness in the, in the workplace, in the factories and so on, that's what Frederick Taylor was suggesting. He also suggested that from this model, there should, it should benefit both managers and workers and owners. Of course, we never, we never really passed that test, the moral test, the ethical test of this model. So over time, this has become ever, ever more tyrannical in most places. We haven't really been good at reforming this. We are currently optimizing and optimizing us to death, to death. And I will argue that even scaled agile frameworks, the so-called Spotify model, and so it's only are only optimizations of the terrible, terrifying model of authoritarianism in organizations. Deeply undemocratic, steering from the top, people's intelligence and voice, people's intelligence is grossly underused, you know, creative potential is squandered. This is a terrible way to run organizations. And of course, you all know that because you know that project management and waterfall, et cetera, came from this, you know, other derivations of this model and they are crap. Any questions until this point? I'm bashing this model here, but it should be clear that this is this is shit, right? It should be not this model belongs on the garbage heap of history. That we should bury it, but we haven't done that within the agile movement yet. Corrado, anything that you want to pick up? Any questions? Well, actually, I have a question, Good. frankly speaking. So following your speech, yes, I understood that the problem is not the Agile scaling is the way the scaling is applied into the organization. What do you think? I'm getting this or I'm... That's a good question. Of course, I, I have my own, own way of framing Agile scaling, and you might have another, but I would say Agile scaling is a terrible idea to begin with, and it could be. Mm -hmm. Of course, the expressions between less and safe are less or more terrible. Mm -hmm. but, but actually uh, my you know, behind the idea good. i think is is a, there's a flawed idea in agile scaling of course and that is that the scrum team or the kanban team if you have many of them you have to create layers of hierarchy to ultimately steer them and mm -hmm. i think the idea of steering is implicitly or explicitly embedded in all agile scaling frameworks we want to steer yeah. Or the, yeah, steer, but... the steering at least is not forbidden. So there is a backdoor open for steering even in less. And what's the other? Not so bad. Scrum of scrums. Scrum at scale. Scrum, scrum at scale. scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But but if if we uh, um, I, of course we could we could discuss why steering is so terrible. I, we could do this for a moment. Uh, okay. To, to understand. Yeah, but however, the reality Niels, is that at least uh, this is my reality. Okay, I'm working in a very big organization. The okay. reality is that I have many cases where one team is not able to work without the collaboration of others. So the reality is moving to scaling teams in some way. Yes. Today, we don't know how to make it, I think. I mean, the framework that you mentioned are proposing something that maybe is not working. This is your idea. But I think that the scaling idea is here. Yes, it's only that, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I think, let's put it like this, scaling is new. So let's consider what we have in scaling to be primitive, foolish, naive attempts to try to scale agile. There is only one big problem with scaling agile. You understand? Do you know what the problem with scaling Agile is? The coordination it cannot be scaled. Things. It okay. cannot. First rule of scaling: don't. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, some of our, Eric is on my page. Here, here's why you shouldn't scale. But this is. I'm, I'm getting. I'm getting a little specific now. Maybe you might consider as ah, he's splitting hairs. You know, he's he's trying to be super smart. I'm not. Let me put this very simple. Scaling is idea. Uh, an idea from the domain of the blue. The blue is the complicated. And there is a domain of the red, which is complexity. Yeah, complexity. So there is a domain in work. There are two domains. There's a guy in the agile movement. He's very recognized, very lauded. I think he's from Wales, a sad guy, really. And he says there are other domains, but there are not other domains. And his model, his little model is so flawed. 
let's not discuss it because it's not really worth it. But what's really important in work and organizations is that we have two, these two different domains, the complex and the complicated. They are not good or bad, bad or good. They are not. They're just different, okay? So relax. But work, all work contains blue bits and red bits. For example, if you want to do software development, lots of red, lots of complexity. You cannot program it, plan it completely. That's why we needed Scrum and Kanban and so on, yeah? Because it has a lot of complexity. Of course, you might say that software architecture creating that is more complex than, than coding. Coding, in a way, once you have the architecture settled, is more blue than red. That's why we can automatize a lot of it, all right? So this is not a clear cut thing. You always have to ask what, what, what is the, in the, in the realm of work, the blue and the red shake hands. They are not divided or separate. They interact. In our work, we, we have like today here, is this complex or complicated? Maybe it has both parts, right? If we have a conversation, it's highly red. Co communication is a very red thing, right? Not communication between machines. That's a blue thing, you know, data transfer. That's a, a blue thing, yeah? In the realm of the blue, we can use process and standards, standards and protocols. And we can automatize it, automatize. And we can automatize, blue stuff can be automatized. It's not always economically efficient to automatize it, but we can. And, and here we can use rules as well to govern things. Now, this is, very important for software development, by the way, to understand this and what this means. But in software development and in work, we also encounter blue problems for which you cannot have a process. You need people with ideas, people with ideas, PWI, very important, people with mastery. People are the only thing in the world that can solve complex problems. Do not believe in people saying AI exists. It doesn't exist because that would be machines with ideas with don't, which do not exist. How do I know? Otherwise, we would all be dead. Yeah? So let's assume for a moment, there's machine learning, but that's on the blue side. It's a great thing. Machine learning, great thing. Yeah? But AI doesn't exist. It would sit, it's, it doesn't exist. It's just science, sci-fi shit. Sci-fi is great. I love sci-fi and Terminator and Her and Ex Machina, great movies and so on. But it's not our thing here. Okay? So in the realm of work, we have complex problems and blue uh, Red problems and blue problems, complex and uh, complicated, they shake hands. And here's the thing. Um, here we need human, human imagination, people with ideas and mastery. Because there is no process to handle the complex. The complex tends to surprise us. Oh, okay. Why, why am I talking about this? Because we only wanted to talk about agile scaling for a moment. Here's the thing. Scaling is an idea from the realm of the blue. You can scale a machine if you, you can put things on, or a house, you can scale it. You can, you know, sometimes in Germany, after World War II, for example, we built top, uh, additional floors on houses that weren't destroyed, so you can scale a house. But you cannot scale something that's alive. That is the Frankenstein idea, which is just sci-fi, you know, from 100 years ago. We cannot scale complex living systems, and we don't have to. They can, like... They, in biology, we have systems, they don't, don't scale, they grow, you know, and we can have growing systems, we can have, you know, market mechanisms in organizations, as you will soon see, you know, but scaling is a mechanistic approach, attempt of organizing software work. The real approaches, they should have a different name, and they should insist on a different set of principles. Okay, I'm not trying to convince you here, I'm just trying to make you think about the reality of the agile movement. I think we have gone in the last 10 years, especially, created tons of new certifications and tools and shit. Most of them are heading in this direction, I, I feel. So I think we are not in it on a good path. Corrado, anything you would like to add at this point? No, yeah. I completely agree, actually, frankly speaking. I put on uh, on the chat an example of red and blue that is particular. I don't know if you know yeah. Mid Journey, the tool. It's an AI tool that is able to draw following your instruction it's yeah. amazing but actually the real complexity in the instruct are they in the instructions that the programmers is giving exactly yeah, yeah. the, the yeah. art is in writing the code the code is the art that has then ex ex its expression in the painting you know but um of course software cannot listen draw invent create 
hear. Those are cognitive things. Cognition, or machines have no cognition. Um, data analysts and scientists and, and computer, you know, machine learning specialists, they have no clue how cognition, how cognition yeah. works. They, they cannot choose. They cannot choose. They cannot choose. They cannot have ideas. Yeah. And ideas are the, are the petrol to master, you know, the, the, the oxygen that we need to master complexity. Yeah. And I'm not being esoteric here. Uh, I'm, I'm being rational and scientific here. Um, uh, you know, IT specialists and so on. We ha they have no clue how to generate ideas, how, how we create ideas as humans. Uh, they have no clue. And that's okay. Because uh, I think that's the inspiring thing. We really need to create organizations that are capable to master the complicated, or where people, in which people are, are, are capable of mastering with rules and processes, protocols, standards, automatization, and this stuff, there where people can master complicated stuff. By the way, when you understand complicated stuff, when you know, when you know, when you have knowledge, the complicated becomes simple. Clear. Clear, trivial, even. In science, we say trivial, right? The complicated becomes trivial. The trivial or the simple is not a separate domain as some quacks like to say or think. The trivial is not a domain of work. It's just the complicated that is known to you. For example, if you know how to write certain code, it becomes trivial for you, yeah? If you know how to do certain things, they become simple. It's not a different realm of work, yeah? It's just the complicated that is less complicated for you. <laughs> yeah, but for the newbie, it's still complicated. So you have to tell the newbie, you have to tran transmit information so that that newbie can learn the thing and so on. Okay. So yeah, just just a quick yeah. comment, uh, Nils, uh, for all the attendees. I don't know if you remember, but last year we have Luca Minodel with uh, an event. The title was the Agile Industrial Complex that uh -huh. was really focused on this idea of frameworks that in theory could solve any solution, but in reality they didn't. So you yes. are invited to go into the YouTube channel and uh, watch this video that is yes. just on this. Yes, the agile industrial complex in a way is, is the creepy, creepy people who want to make money with selling agile to <laughs> alpha organization without changing them. And that makes a lot of money, you know. May I be very provocative for a moment? Yeah, you, you have to. <laughs> but do not feel offended if you are. I, okay, agile coaches, if you are an agile coach, please write yes into or why into, into the chat, just for fun. This is just for fun. You don't have to do it. It's just voluntary because I will then provoke you a little bit. Yeah, some of you are, right? Yeah. I think you are all aware, all agile coaches in the world are aware that agile coaching should not exist, right? Agile coaching is like a... How oh, is it? If you cannot walk properly, you have to use a walking stick, right? Which is okay. I once had a broken leg and I needed two fucking walking sticks. Nothing against walking sticks. I think walking sticks are fine. I'm also prepared. prepared. I want to, not sure what, how you feel, but I want to be, to live until I'm 90 and ideally with a clear head and still working and doing this kind of session, provoking people and, and doing stuff and doing transformation. Uh, and if I then use a walking stick, that's fine by me. I think with, with if you are 90, using one of these walking things is fine, you know? So nothing against walking sticks. However, Agile is for the people with the people, Scrum, Agile, Kanban, and so on. For the people, with the people, by the people, everyone can handle it. Everybody should learn it. You should not need an Agile coach. In the long run, I think in, in a Scrum team, you shouldn't even need an agile uh, a Scrum master. Everybody should become a Scrum master very quickly after three or six months in a Scrum on a Scrum team. Everybody should be capable of slipping into the role of Scrum master. Okay, some you might have some people who who, are, who, who do not like the role and so on, but you know it shouldn't be dramatic. So here's the thing: if we have agile coaches. Or you're, if you are an agile coach to a company, it's likely that the client company or the client you work for is alpha. So in a way, you are a walking stick to people who try to make some scrum happen in the evil, doomed, bullshit system of alpha command and control. I think that's a problem. We, we all have an, a, an identity, an industrial problem. That's the uh, part of the agile industrial comp uh, complex, I think. We are selling the wrong tool to the wrong, or wrong kinds of organization. What am I suggesting here? Maybe it's obvious to you already from what I said, but what I'm suggesting is we should 
Of course, we should go on to promote Scrum and Agile. Of course, we should go. However, it's not enough. We should also promote transformation. Let's not just pimp up the wrong model. Let's transform organizations to beta. Let's decentralize them because that's the, the one of the consequences of transforming from alpha to beta is decentralizing. Can you see it? In an alpha organization, the people at the top, they do the steering. This organization is centralized. I will make a bigger illustration. Is that okay? By the way, you can ask questions in the chat and then Corrado will try to interrupt me and, and you know, we can. Yeah, actually there is, a, there is a question, but I think it's more a provocation that is who are the coaches coaching? <laughs> so it's- um, Who are the coaches coaching? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, brilliant question, right? Or are we really coaching in agile coaching? Because, you know, coaching, the original coaching was I have to look for a coach if I have a problem. I look for a coach and I decide if that person shall coach me and if I will accept the coaching. Of course, agile coaching is done in a different way. People do not have a choice. It's coercive, usually. You know, people are ob obliged to be coached. Like HR people coming to you and saying, I I'm, from, I'm from corporate, I'm here to help. You either accept my help or you die. Yeah, it's a little bit like that. Yeah. Yeah, but the point I want to make is that those agile coaches should be coaching the top of the pyramid yes. of the alpha organization. Yes. Those who are resisting change. Yes. Ah, that's, a, that's great. May I use this? Th thank you for this comment. Um, Go ahead. This is beautiful. You just said the usual thing that we think in, 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 in most communities, which is be it's, it's beautiful. I'm not criticizing it. It's a... Did you, not sure if you heard it, but what our colleague here said, but he said people at the top are the problem. He said people at the top are resisting, managers, executives. Here's, a, the, here's the most provocative idea that I have to, for you tonight. Yeah, I think it's terrifying. Maybe your heads will blow. Please, if your head's going to explode, if your head is going to explode, turn off the camera before. We don't want to see this. Yeah. So... But here's the mind-blowing idea that I have for you. And you may not like it. Here's the thing. This is called beta. Do you remember that I called this beta, this model? And I called this the shit model. I called it alpha, right? Here's provocative short uh, thought of the night. Everybody wants beta. Everybody wants beta. This may sound simple, but... The radical idea that I have for you is that everybody in an alpha organization, regardless which alpha organization, it might be, you know, I'm in Germany. We have Siemens, we have Bosch, other, other countries have Tesla and our other terrible companies. You know, we also have Volkswagen, others have Ford and whatever terrible organization, telecoms and public administration, and, and, and they are all terrible alpha organizations, right? The provocative idea is everybody already wants beta. We do not have to convince anybody about beta. Never try to convince people of beta. For example, I give, I'm not sure if this is provocative to you, but I think it's a provocative idea. Have you ever tried to convince anybody of agile? You shouldn't. You should just convince, you should just talk about people about waterfall shit, how shitty waterfall is. That's what we should have done the last 20 years, but we didn't. We jumped to conclusions. We, are sell, we sell tools and coaching. And you know, like, um, it's like, it's like, what's this cream that you put on your skin if it's damaged and it heals very quickly, cortisone. Do you know cortisone? It's very effective. It's fucking effective at the, at the, as the Americans would say, right? It's incredibly effective. Of course, it doesn't solve underlying problems if you put cortisone stuff on your skin to heal it. It will heal maybe, but there might be other things that it doesn't, you know. So you, to, to, we have tried to solve symptoms and we haven't erased the problem. Again, the problem is, somebody already um, put it in the chat here. The problem is theory X thinking. If you think that people are lazy, stupid, foolish idiots, lazy that must be forced and bribed and coerced into doing some work and to make an effort that they must steer and controlled all the time, then you will end up creating alpha prison organizations, right? Alpha organizations. You need, you, you have to have individual targets and OKR shit and incentives and steer them and force them and a budget and you cannot trust your managers. 
So you inevitably, with if you if you believe in theory X thinking, as Douglas McGregor coined it 60 years ago, you will end up creating alpha organizations. The solution is to assume, no, no, people are intrinsically motivated, capable, willing to contribute. Some are assholes. Fire them if you find them, yeah, in your organization. Assholes exist, but theory X people do not exist. Every even every asshole in the world, is that okay, the language, Corrado? I can, I can say this in Spanish, yeah. You must have cojones to fire the assholes. That's, that's necessary in a beta organization, yeah? But if you assume that everybody in the world is intrinsically motivated, wants to, wants to identify with the fucking purpose and the value creation that flows outside into the market, yeah? If you assume that people want to make a contribution, that they can grow in the work, that the happiness, there is a big movement in, 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 in the agile, a big industry, uh, industrial player in the agile movement, trying to sell us that we have to make people happy so that they can work. But it's the other way around. The work is supposed to make people fucking happy. If the work is great, people will be fucking happy. If you have 7,000 people and the work is great and we have flow from the inside out and clients are happy because we have done great work, then we will also be happy. People in the organization, Max and Maria and Chen and whoever is here, they will be happy. So happiness, you cannot create it without having great work environment and a great organization, which is why organizations suck and have people leaving silently, quietly, quitting in every way of the world, uh, every way that exists, because organizations are suck and we are still in command and control. Fuck all organizations, imprisoned organization, imprisoned in, in prison-like organizations. Okay, that was a rant, right? But here's the thing. This organization is possible if you start to believe the provocative thing that I'm suggesting to you. And here's the thing. If you believe that everybody wants beta, if you have, a, I, I currently have a client, they have 7,000 people. It's not so small, right? Not so small. Nobody in that organization knows everybody. But assume that among those 7,000 people, they are an alpha organization. They are in, in trouble, of course. Yeah, organization by the, organizationally. The business is okay, yeah, still okay, but it hurts, it aches, you know? So our suggestion, of course, is uh, transform to beta. It just takes 90 days. We can explain this. We can discuss this a little later. Transformation is possible. Let's work the system, not the people. So you will have 7,000 people after 90 days working in a beta organization. And here's the thing to my friend here. I cannot see his name so well on my computer. Um, who just said, ah, people at the top will resist. Let's assume that they will not resist. Let's assume for a moment, just fool yourself that you can believe it for a moment. Yeah? If people at the top also want beta, if they will not resist it, they will be the main beneficiaries of the transformation. Then transformation is easy. Well, not easy. It's still complex. It's it, and it will hurt a bit, you know, because everybody will get wet. We like to say that if we work with a company with seven thousand people, we guarantee everybody will get wet, including the CEO and general managers. All yeah, everybody will get wet. They all have to change. They have to change their habits and their reflex. They have to train their reflexes because their reflexes are terrible command control shit. Yeah, but this is the crucial, crucial thing, and I, I think it's great that our colleague here. Um, Rene, I think, not sure who was it, um, when he said, ah, people at the start, the, the secret sauce to what I'm telling you today, tonight is resistance to change does not exist. People only resist terrible change method, but not the change, not the intuition, not the, not the, not the, let's say the, they, they resist the means not the meaning, you know, not the, not, the, not the intention. If the intent is good, then people will say, well, that's good. Just don't fuck me over. And change management is all about fucking people over. In a way, even agile coaching is about fucking people over. Yeah. In a way, I'm not saying that you want to fuck people over, but you know, it's intrinsic to certain methods that we want to fuck people over, that we want to, we want to change people. Uh, or blame people. It's intrinsic in so many uh, organizational me methods, even some that look good, like uh, employee surveys, target setting, bonuses, they look good, right? Bonuses look fucking good. Yeah, a ton of money that you're dangling in my face like a carrot looks freaking good. 
but I'm not a donkey. Yeah, I, I think you are not donkey, so it doesn't work so well. It's it's all stuff to fuck people over. Assessment centers, development centers, you know, the whole reporting mess that we have in organization. The the too much measures instead of. And here's the trick. This is the model I'm talking about. Where should we move to before we talk about the how? I will give you a little bit more info, and then we can discuss. All right? Is that okay, Corrado? Some more information, some more model. Stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me let me ask again. If you have questions, please uh, raise your hand uh, and uh, join the conversation. Join yeah. the conversation. Yeah. Cognitively, it's too much for me to also read the uh, read the chat. I have to think and 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 write. And I will try to make the we, we try to interact as much as we can. I will let you know, Miss. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> of course, traditional organizations, alpha organizations. Remember that they are centralized. Looking at organizations as sim as systems, that would mean that the center steers the periphery this central part is called the center and the other part is called the periphery now if you do not know these words center or periphery you cannot think intelligently about organizations which is why scaling models all scaling models are fucked they do not talk about center and periphery which they would need if they were good but they are not even the so-called Spotify, mo um, Spotify model has no clue of decentralization, of periphery, of empowering the periphery. So if you see a new model or tool and it doesn't understand decentralization, you know it's shit. You don't have to look further. Why is that so? Remember that we discussed complexity? We discussed complexity, yeah? And remember, work always has to the two things holding hands, so to speak, talking to each other, you know, interacting. In a project, a project is overwhelmingly complex, but it also has some has some blue parts. These are not separate domains. We also the, in the domain of work, we have to deal with both problems. So remember, work is com it has complex parts, yeah, components. Work always has complex bits in it. Otherwise, we can easily automatize it away and so on. Yeah. Yeah. This so, Yes, yes, we have a question. Yes. By the way, uh, from Eric. Eric, if you if you can unmute, you can make your question directly to Nis, please. If you like. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. I was looking for the button. Eric, we already with... know each other online, right? Yeah, of course we do. I like um, you. I have good associations with your name on LinkedIn, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very much into a deep philosophical um, analysis of, uh, of agility these days. I, I tend to base agility on, on, on intentionality. And I, 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 and for fun, I like to say, if your intention is not to be agile, then, may, then you're agile. Um, <laughs> then you are I've, agile if your intention is not... Explain yeah. that, please. I'll, I'll, I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you um, work that one in your brain. It's 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 a it's a it's a brain twister there. Uh, yeah. But basically, my question here is: um, okay. What if agility is not about letting go of, of command and control, uh, but to inspect, adapt, and applying the proper approach based on the context? Yes. Uh, I tend I tend to subscribe more to a William Schneider uh, approach in his uh, reengineering alternative, where he says there are no bad cultures. Uh, only cultures that are not necessarily adapted to the context. Um, so yeah, but, he, but so, exactly, so I'm, very good, Eric, Eric. But here's the thing, and and it matches exactly what I was about to talk about. You know, if we accept that markets are complex, markets are complex. That is the context of every organization. This is a given context. Only if we destroy the world in a nuclear uh, destruction, your Mad Max style we would have complexity going down. But we have a lot of market complexity. Do we agree, Eric, on that? Oh, yeah, we do live in a VUCA world, absolutely. OK, you call it VUCA. I just call it complex, because VUCA is like saying complex five four times. Yeah, it is, actually. Yeah, <laughs> it's for, because it's very complex. <laughs> it's, for, it's for crazy people. But sometimes okay. you have to repeat four times for folks to. <laughs> Only but here's the thing. <laughs> I, I, I already like you very much, the, the real you, Eric, not just the social media written one on LinkedIn. But here's the thing. Okay, so let's accept for a moment that, uh, and we may disagree, of course, but it makes no sense. Yeah, Mark, The world is complex, markets are complex, competitive, globalized, and, and shit. Yeah? Mm -hmm. 
That means that is the context of organizations. It means also that value creation be, will become more complex because the markets become more surprising, choosier, more dynamic, volatile, all these VUCA things, yeah? Now, in that context of complexity, that is the context that turns alpha, fucked up, evil, toxic bullshit. And it's very important to always make this connection, Eric. Thank you for reminding me, because I just, I, I like to just judge over it because to me, it's so clear. If you have complex markets, then alpha cannot work because alpha is based on the idea that you can steer organizations from the inside out against market forces, which in mm -hmm. complexity is a massacre. Weapon, centralization and steering is a weapon of motivational mass destruction. Yeah. A weapon of value creation destruction. Do we now agree, Eric? That's why alpha is shit. Not because I say so, but because the world is, markets are complex, period. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It, it doesn't make sense. And, and, and calling alpha uh, shit in the context of a conference it, is cool. I, I, do, um, no, I do recommend no, yeah. that we don't qualify is... in that way in, in when we're coaching or a, a company, uh, an organization. We, See, we have to... that is the problem, Eric. <laughs> That's why we are all fucked. Because you, this is great. Thank you for saying this. This is beautiful. Eric, I, and we don't have to agree, remember? Uh, this, this is exactly my point. I think we have to enlighten people that alpha is full of shit. Any alpha pattern, model, tool, behavior, organization, structure is full of shit. Mm -hmm. And Eric just said, oh, we cannot talk about that in the, like that in the corporate setting. I do exactly that. And guess what? It works. At least I'm not dead, you know? I'm, I have not starved. So relax, Eric. I think we have to do this. I have to, and here's the thing, here's the point. I love this interaction with Eric already. And, 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 and I love that the other, another hand just went up already. Here's the thing. If we do not tell the CEOs of this world, the top executives, the managers of this world, how terrible alpha is, they will never understand. They will say that Scrum and whatever, Hubban and Beta and stuff, it's just topsy-turvy, beautiful, esoteric stuff, which it is not. It is factual. This is the science. This is alter, total prehistoric bullshit. Prehistoric in the sense of in the, in the industrial age, this worked well enough. Today, the alpha doesn't work enough. No, it doesn't work well enough. Centralized steering has no future, even though it has no, no present. It is just, it sucks life out of organizations and people and our economies. Beautiful point, Eric, I think that you raised. I think this is, my, this is my challenge to us all, to you all, if you accept it, if you want it. Let's be more frank with managers. Let's not keep them blind and stupid about this. This is the real thing. We need to get there. It's, mm -hmm. This is like, do or do not. There is no try. We need to do is we need to bring the force in, you know, against the dark side. <laughs> we need to be more dramatic. We need to be blunt about the shit that managers are doing. We need to tell them in their face this, you know, steering committees. I tell my clients in the first meeting, the first time I meet them, I tell them, you will, in order to get here, you need to abolish steering committees, you know, all kinds of co committees, all kinds of planning in the organization, individual targets and bonuses, all that shit that you think is professional. It cannot work, and here's why. And then we explain. Yeah, and this, have to do this, of course. I'm just suggesting it to you. You can also. I I, I I don't want to start a debate. This is this is your moment. I want to leave you there. But look Please on don't. on another side. If you tell if you tell the C level that the that alpha is is shit, they'll say, yeah, yeah that's good news because we're not alpha. Uh, actually, we're we're fully agile. We we've installed a uh, safe, and we're fully agile. Uh, so I agree, alpha is shit, and we are full beta. But the, not. Trick, the trick is <laughs> that they haven't changed their behavior. They, it's words. It's just words. They haven't words. changed their behavior. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but, but this, this is a great discussion. Um, but I think it's be, it's behavior. Everybody everybody is part of the behavioral problem. I, I like to say in an alpha organization, everybody behaves like shit. Everybody. <laughs> there are no. There is no good life in the in the bad system. That's a German philosopher who said this. You know, he said this a little bit different, but. Basically, there is no, there is no good behavior in fascism. You know, there is no good person in fascism. There is less bad and more bad, but it's all bad. You know, so I think it's fair to 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 get 
to get philosophical, which I think is very practical. Let's let's be philosophical. Let's tell them to their faces. Your behavior must change. Of course, your behavior is shit. It brought you this far. It's okay. Your organization is still alive. But your organization, this is how I tell what I also add. Your organization is still alive. It, in spite of the shit model that you are running, your organization is still profitable or it's still somehow profitable or very profitable, but it could be so much better if you had a good model. Yeah, well, let's get, let, let, let's get into the, the, the title of this conference. So it's not Bob, the CEO's behavior that is bad. Bob's behavior is dictated by the system. Dictated, yeah, okay, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's behavior is shit because of the shit system. The system, we must work the system to, to drive shit behavior mm -hmm. out of the organization. Sorry, Christina. No, I was just saying, because I, I put my hand up because I think a lot of us were not calling bullshit. I've said it previous to lots of people. I see lots of agile coaches who are condoning the same behavior. They're going into big tear organizations and they're just becoming a part of the command and control system. Yeah. And they're pretending otherwise because they like the praise that they get from being an agile coach in yeah. a big organization. Yeah. So if there's nobody actually saying to these big orgs who are now, we are agile, nobody who, went in there to help with the transformation Who every is honest... agile coach i think every day should talk tell to teams but remember yeah. i'm doing my best here but remember this is not real agile we're just faking it here together okay we're doing the best in a shit system you know and i as an agile coach am trying to help you do the maximum yeah. with scrum etc in a shit system and just so that we are clear this is not agility this yeah. is just the shit system optimized you know and and the reason why the community hasn't advanced as much is we spent too much time fighting about which one is better, who can call it, who can call themselves a coach or not, yeah. who is a good scrum master, or why everybody else doesn't have the right values and we're so much better than them. And, and that's this, this struggle, it will go on, by the way, this will always, it will always go on. Oh, is, is beta better than teal and mm -hmm. better than lean? Is, is lean better than beta? Or oh, huh, huh, huh. This will go on, go on forever. And that's why I always say, if this kind of approach, it needs to be open source so that anyone could do it. And you can, you can call it differently, but please name the source. Maybe you have heard about Daniel Mezik's work. It's all, we have to make this, all this shit, the good shit, we have to make it open source so that people can use it, reframe it in the way they like, you know, you can call it beta plus if you like, I don't give a fuck. You know, what I'm interested in is that we make transformation happen and not just improve misery. And that is what Agile today, is, is a lot about optimized misery. Yeah? That's, that's is, what it's doing. Yeah? And it's okay to earn money on improved misery today, but do not be a hypocrite. You should remember yourself and your clients. And I, I loved what Christina just said, you know, be, be, be frank about it. Don't, don't fool yourself that it's all, we are already there. We are not. Yeah? That, are, that's, part of the, that, that's part of the reason why I'm fine with calling myself an agile coach whenever I want to, because yeah. I realize a lot of people in the community are like, oh, you don't have that much experience and you can't call yourself an agile coach. And yeah. I'm like, really? Are we a community where we're all working together to transform or we're just kind of nitpicking about who should, who can, yes. and can, you know, yes. cannot call themselves something? Yes, <laughs> yes. Corrado, you also- yeah, No, yeah. Uh, actually, there is a, another question coming from uh, yeah. Renee about uh, uh, the learning organization. Renee, if you want to put the conversation in your direction. By the way, that's uh, just to speak before Renee speaks. Uh, learning organization. That's a. If you haven't read uh, Peter Senke's book from the 1990s about the learning organization, the fifth, uh, five, how is it called? The fifth. fifth you have to read it. Peter Senke's big, big best-selling book, uh, the fifth. What is it called? I the fifth discipline. The fifth, fifth, fifth discipline. discipline. Yeah. You have to read it, right? That's yeah. because that's it's it's very much about beta philosophy. Beta, it's it 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 spells out much of beta. But here again, more recommendations before Rene speaks because I, I love that he brought this up. This all goes back to Mary Parker Follett, the first agile philosopher or beta philosopher in the world. In the world, I I wrote a couple of papers about her. Her work is incredible. Hundred years ago, she died in 1933. There are others like Peter Senge who wrote this great book. He also wrote some shitty books, but. Yeah, there are, there are so many uh, philosophers on this side or thinkers, Chris Argyris, of course, um, 
and uh, others like Tom Peters and so on. So we have a lot of knowledge about this model. Don't get me wrong that this is, this is not new. I have not created it. Yeah? And I just suggest that we should treat this always as open source. Yeah? And some of the tools or concepts I, I will talk about today, open space beta, for example, the way of transforming any organization, regardless of size or background of industry within 90 days to beta, that's an open source technology. You, you just do it. You can even call yourself an open space beta practitioner, if you like. I cannot, I cannot bring it, take it to the courts. You can say it. If you can do it with a client, that's a different story, but I will not stop you from, from calling yourself like that. So open source, I think, is a very important thing if we want to be more united over time as a, com as a community, as a, as a movement. Rene, sorry for interrupting you before you start. No, don't worry. It was a bit of a reaction on Eric Laramé's uh, 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 question about you know, letting go of command and control and do inspect and adapt and, and control collaboration cultivation. But that is still a bit static, you know, in, a, in, in my mind, in the sense that, yes, you do these steps, inspect, adapt, control, collaboration, cultivation. But how do you, how do you, how do you create a learning organization that gets much uh, mature with every step, with every iteration, with every cycle? How do you strive for getting to that mastery, getting to that decentralized, trusting your people, let them do, let those people in the periphery do what they do and know best. You know, it, inspect and adapt, it, it, that's very interesting, but as long as you only do it in name only, oh, it's an, it's an activity we need to do after every whatever iteration. You know, I love the critical thinking in this session. It's incredibly enjoyable right after three years of fuck oh covid period you know it's 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 lovely to have this kind of exchange thank you Corrado, for making this happen and 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 also let's uh, let's remember that um pdca and so on are techniques right or inspect adapt and so on they're great techniques by the way there's a lot of wisdom in them however if you crystallize them into tools you will miss the whole idea and remember pdca it 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 had it brought it was brought to best fruition by companies like Toyota that actually decentralized decision making and created a beta organization with yeah. a cell structure, you know, small team, small, highly autonomous teams. And they do their PDCA. They do their Kaizen, as they might call it at Toyota, yeah. right? And this, the power of this is just a great tool for a group or a cycle, a cyclic thing, or these are concepts for. You, you could still Excuse do that. Center, you can do still do PDCA in a centralized oh, yeah. Taylorist Taylorism way of working. Yeah. And and the point that most managers miss about the Toyota way of working is trusting your people, delegating, decentralizing, and let them figure it out. By the way, just to just to provoke Rene a little bit. Please go ahead. But it's just for the sake of fun, you know. It's just playful, playfulness. Um, I, I, I remember that I always said, uh, Rene, that uh, it's important to always remember people, remind people of alpha misery, and not just sell beta. What you just did is you said a few words, and of course you used some alpha words. I'm suggesting that they are alpha words. Here in in this model we have decentralization. All right. That means teams in the periphery are in charge to create value for external clients or customers. And the center serves the periphery so that the periphery can serve the market. And this can only work if the periphery buys services and pays for servers of the center. All right? That is decentralization. It means the periphery is charged. The periphery has the money. The center cannot have any money. Cells in the periphery do not earn money. They just break even, so to speak. And the periphery retains the margins, the profit margins, if we are talking about a business, commercial business, of course. All right? Here's the thing. Decentralization. In alpha, there is a thing, a concept, a, an idea that we use to bring the power down. Uh, Rene, you just mentioned, do you want to repeat the word? Delegate? Trust yes, people. delegate. Yeah. It's a concept from the realm of command and control. A boss delegates something to a subordinate, but I can take it back. It's not a principle. It's not a law. It's not, I'm not obliged to delegate. Yeah. So delegation, in a way, and this is, this is, the ultimate mindfuck, I think, 
it's worth checking all the, our words that we use, the concepts that we use, like strategy. Are they really part of this? Or are they more part of command and control ideology? It's a, it's a lot of work. For me, this was the hardest work over the last 20 years to get rid of vocabulary. Uh, you know, that I, I we, we all inherited so much wording and terms and language from command and control, we are not even aware. Like, oh, the, the business language is full of it, right? Like kickoffs, for example, or break down and roll out and, 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 and get into the boat and, Oh, there's so much terrible thing, you know, top performance, high performance, low performance, high potentials, low potentials. Oh my God, there's so much terrible language out there, right? So this is a recommendation to also always contemplate, are we trying to delegate or decentralize? By the way, there is a, a little card set that is sold in the agile sphere. Do you have this card set? Nope. Delegation, <laughs> throw it away. It's all 50 shades of command and control of evilness. Yeah, one of I shall not use it if you want decentralization. <laughs> okay, now, now I want to have some clarity because yeah. one of the first things I noted down is that you said we should stress the problems with alpha yes. instead of selling the benefits of beta. Yes. How can we stress the problems of alpha without using the words, the, the, the targets, the, the vision of beta? No, I, I think this is this is my recommendation for you, Rene, and everyone. Of course, to Eric as well, yeah, and everyone here. Always use the two sides. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that on my flip chart, I did that a couple of times already, and I would go on every time you would bring up vocabulary, I would put it here or here to frame it, to make it clear, to to make distinctions. This is very powerful, a powerful idea from the German systems theorist and sociologist uh, Niklas Luhmann. He suggested that definitions are lame, but distinctions strike. Okay, so that's a, that is why it's important to distinguish between decentralization and delegation. Or sometimes I like to say the right model is leadership, but if that's leadership, then what would we have as a ah, man, let's call it management, the social technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we have individual targets and incentives, what do we have here? Our oh, relative targets. We have different concepts on the right than on the left. Always make distinctions. Of course, I cannot convince you to do that. You either use it in your work. It's very powerful because then we start framing, creating similar languages and framings. And we can, for example, only, only if we have the two things here. I will give you an example. Okay, strategy. I learned this at my, I studied business administration, economics and this, this stuff long time ago, yeah. Strategy was all the rage. Michael Porter, first, first person to suggest strategy, and he became the, the creator of that movement. Yeah? Just like Jeff, what Jeff, Jeff Sutherland and uh, Ken Beck are for Scrum, Michael Porter was for the strategy movement. It was huge. Yeah? Now, by the way, that has been rebaptized. Strategy shit has already been rebaptized into what? Canvases. Sorry, in what? Canvases. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Business model canvas, operating yeah. model canvas. All yeah. kinds of, we're canvassing the shit out of organizations. But here's the thing. Strategy, it was a way of reframing in an alpha organization. You have this problem that you have the thinking at the top and the doing at the bottom. All right? In a beta organization, where do you have thinking and where do you have doing? At the periphery. Everywhere in the periphery, you, in every cell, you need thinking and doing. In the center, you need thinking and doing. In a way, an alpha organization must, like in Toyota, must reunite the thinking and the doing in teams, eliminate the steering, reunite the thinking and the doing, so people have to think and act. It's uh, this inspect and adapt and, and PDCA. They can do all this because it makes them think and adapt, think and adapt. You know, think and act, thinking and doing. Everywhere, if you have an organization in which thousands of people. Always think and act all the time. You do not need fucking strategy. Strategy is was just a code so that you could call, ah, we have strategy people at the top, thinkers, and the, the losers, we call them, well, operational, operational. They are losers. And then we have the worst tactics in between. Technical, you know? They are they are stuck between, you know, they are. Totally do it. So in a way, our corporate language has evolved. We have rebaptized the same stupid concept. And to make this 
to socialize these ideas. There's no other way to, to always combine the two models. For example, somebody asked me, where's strategy here? No strategy, but you have to have a sphere of activity that serves as a boundary for the organization so that it doesn't fall apart. You need to be highly disciplined in beta, and this sphere disciplines people, not people, not the center disciplines the periphery, no, no, the boundary principles and so on. Uh, like in a democracy, what, 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 what stops me from killing people in a democracy? You might say the bullies, that's not true, of course, but it's an understanding of you know, principles, the constitution. Yeah, the ethics. The 80s? The ethics. I should have ethics, yes. That's, I, at school, I learned ethics. By the way, we need more ethical organizations. And in command and control, you cannot expect ethics. That's why alpha organizations also suck. They are so, we are all look, always look at bosses at the top. So ethics fly out of the window. You have OKRs and other fucked up targets and incentives and bonuses. No ethics there. Yeah. There's a question. Uh, yeah, from Aaron. Yes, I, I have a, a provocation, but I want to wait. Aaron, please ask your question. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so I, I work primarily with industrial companies, and um, they tend to have very uh, basically stable capital life cycles. Even if there's a downturn or there's a change in the cycle, everything's sort of calibrated, almost like a shock absorber or like an accordion. But I think something that doesn't really get discussed much is that if you're if you work in service organizations or, or peer service organizations or uh, highly regulated industries, their drivers are radically different than you find in industrial organizations. And so when you're implementing these highly delegative um, approaches, which can be delegated very or decentralized. In, I'm sorry. Delegated or decentralized. This is what I do with my clients all the time. Oh, I, I, I would I say both, but, actually. Just, no, 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 but okay. I try to. Uh, this is this is so brilliant. Thank you for bringing this up again. You said delegation, and what do I do? I remind you that delegation. I mean, all of you. I try to remind you that delegation is from here and here, this is about these. Sure, so, 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 so decentralized to, to be clean language if you yeah. want to do that. Uh, so, so decentralized organizations because they have a product and capital cycle that's driven around a production and demand cycle because there tends to be a pretty transparent value chain. What are you saying? But when you, but when you work in service or regulatory driven organizations, they typically have to be very reactive, right? They don't sign sustainable contracts. Uh, it's very hard to, uh, to drive a huge amount. seriously saying this? This is the first time I'm hearing this argument this way around. It's well, I can prove it. I mean, you could prove it in the insurance industry. You could prove yeah, it no, in, prove it. in, in legal, legal services. You could prove oh. it in many other professional services. Oh. Sure you can. No, no. You're, you're gonna, I can show you. I can show you are you going to suggest that business services have the same capital cycle that an auto company has? A capital cycle? Don't. That word doesn't even exist. That expression doesn't even exist. But let me. Cap let me okay, the way they spend capex. Okay. The, the, okay. the professional business capex. services okay. don't spend okay. capex. Just for a second, I love this. I love this thing, and I wanted to applaud because I've never heard it this way around. Usually, it's the other way around. People tell me in sessions like this, they tell me. Ah, oh, this can be done in topsy-turvy software development organization and service organization, but not in industry. Industry must become under control. And you are turning it around because of the capital thing and legislation. But here's the thing. I can show you a law firm that's beta. I can show you a bank. Uh -huh. I can say to you, to show you a health organization. I can show you an industrial organization. I did so, Toyota. I can show you retail organizations that are beta. All kinds of beta organizations exist from all kinds of industries. Don't believe what I'm saying. I don't expect you to be, but Southwest Airlines uh, is also a, a great, great uh, example of oh, new core from the United States. You know, there are mm -hmm. all kinds of industrial beta organizations, but also service organizations. Why would services not be potentially decentralized? Well, because when your contract cycles are annual or less, because your services are provided on a very short-term basis, all of your drivers become utilization. 
because people can't break themselves up into individual units of unbillability, right? Meaning people oh. work and expect to get paid 45, 40 hours a week. And if the demand isn't there for their work, then that ultimately drives what you would call bench or inventory in any other industry. And that slows down the allocation cycle that you can have with change. I mean, are you going to say that because we don't build cars like that? You can't build planes like that. You can't wait, build... wait. Do you listen? Yeah. Do you listen? Yeah. I said Toyota is a beta organization. And they're a customer of mine. I know so them pretty just... well. And, yeah. and wait, your, your, your argument is going topsy-turvy now. I mean, no, at the beginning not. you said industrial organizations can do it and others can't, which is- Well, I, I, I said, no, I didn't say the word can't. I said it's, it tends to be pretty limited, right? You, you okay. put the more declarative language, Here's the thing. not me. We, we cannot finish and I cannot debunk the mistakes, the, the flawed ideas or ideas okay. behind the rationale. I cannot debunk it. We don't have the time. And, okay. Um, and maybe I, I, was, I wouldn't even be able to debunk. Maybe we would disagree if we continue to, to talk about it. And I do not try to convince you. Let, let me not try to convince you, but let, let me give you the examples. We all know that Bozark case, right? Have you heard of the Bozark case from Frederick yeah. Lalu's book? It's the best thing in his book, the Bozark case, health organization. I talk, talked about Toyota. I mentioned, I mentioned a bank, Handelsbanken, Sweden's most uh, successful, or Europe's most successful bank for five decades. I mentioned Southwest Airlines, we could mention WL Gore, we could say Guardian Industries, which is produces mirrors and, 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 and glass. Mm -hmm. uh, we could uh, DM Dorimat Aldi, uh, retail company and so on. Here's the thing, I do not want to prove anything to you. I'm, I'm just trying to, I can only invite you in this session, I can only invite you to think that maybe this thing, beta, is possible in every industry. Yeah. And take the Toyota example. Toyota has caused havoc on the American automotive industry. And of course, a company like Volkswagen Germany is only really surviving so well that relatively well as they're doing. They are performing like shit, of course, and Toyota is performing much better for decades. But they are surviving because there's pr protectionism in Germany. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we might see alpha organizations that have beta competitors struggle for decades until they fall apart, yeah? Like tick Southwest Airlines, and then there's Delta and American Airlines going into chapter 11 bankruptcy protection every third year or so, yeah? That is the kind of havoc that beta competitors inflict upon alpha organizations, not because they have worse people, they have the worst model, yeah? Now, is use of capital different in different industries? Yes. Is product size different? For example, I once had this guy from an e-commerce company coming to Germany for a workshop with me. They had implemented implemented holacracy, which by the way is an alpha shit years before. One of the biggest e-commerce companies. He was, he, uh, he, at the time he was still CEO of Zappos. Maybe you've heard of him, Tony Shea. He has passed away sadly. Uh, and at the time, they got interested in overcoming whole accuracy and doing something decent. So we talked about decentralization and had a workshop on that. Can you do beta in e-commerce? How do you do it? How does a periphery cell like if you say that every cell should only have maybe seven or eight people max, maybe nine, but definitely not 10 or 12? How can, how can you build or create an idea of a company like Toyota, hundreds of thousands of people, as just a structure of cells, a decentralized cell structure in which every cell has around seven people. Minimum five people, maximum eight or so, ideally, right? How is that possible? It's very hard to imagine. Maybe you agree with me and maybe this was behind the question as well. It's so hard to imagine in any organization be built upon this kind of structure. Just to give you an, a, an idea, if you have this kind of structure, you do not have a sales department. Sales departments, that's an idea from the realm of command and control. It's a toxic idea turned structure. Yeah. So no beta organization has a sales department. Who sells in a beta organization, you might ask? And maybe this is a part, a little bit of an, um, an answer to the doubts of our friend who just spoke. Marco, I think, not sure. Uh, who sells in a beta organization? The answer is, of course, every cell in the periphery 
every cell we call the unit here yeah, in which a team of five to eight people or so resides we call that a cell yeah, like in biology every cell has to sell in a beta organization you don't have a sales sales department but every cell needs to sell needs to make business sell to clients so it is but toyota has a sales department yeah do they sorry do they well they do at a regulatory level they have to that's the point exactly for regular purposes you can you can call uh any numbers that you hold up a budget or a plan yeah you can do that yeah but the structure of the shops for example is yeah. not part yeah. of the, the team shop. that is building a shop is a unit within the cell structure design maybe yeah but they are selling not building so they are also not... selling and they are billing and they are servicing look at uh, i i bought a toyota recently or i hired a Toyota recently, you know? Um, and when I walk there, when I go there, they sell it, but they also have services, you know? So uh, the idea of the of a decentralized cell structure, and, and you, it, you, might, you may find it hard to think of your organization as an organization without functional division, because this is what we are all used to, right? Here's the terrible thing about alpha. It is highly addictive thinking, right? It teaches us, that in order to be efficient, that's another idea from the industrial age, efficiency. Efficiency comes from the realm. Uh, however, this, sorry to interrupt, but I yeah. think that you mentioned a very, very disruptive and important concept. Okay. I mean, when you say they did decentralize the sales department, you are telling that the sales that we can see in a beta organization actually can be different. So it's something like a biological organism with different organs, where you have cells of different types and they are doing, this is what you are proposing. That's what, that's what I'm proposing. And yeah, by the way, the idea of efficiency gains comes from the realm of the blue. In the blue, you can reap efficiency gains. In the realm of the complex, not so much. If you, if you merge two highly complex service organizations, you have almost zero um, uh, uh, scaling effects or if, uh, economies of scale, as they are called in economics, because only the only the complicated scales and only there do you have huge efficiency gains potential. Yeah, not in living organizations. So yes, the idea, as Corrado said, said it, the idea of a beta organization is that every cell becomes a mini company within the company, at least every cell in the periphery, becomes a mini company within the company. And these companies start to serve each other and charging each other. The center charges the periphery. And then the periphery serves the external client. So to that, because we are used to divide functions. And in a cell structure design, functions are integrated. If you Google cell structure design, you will find our open source method around what I'm explaining here. It's called cell structure design. It's an open source social technology. And of course you can use it and we have plenty tons of material. Much of it is explained in our books as well, but you don't have to buy the books. You can do it if you like. Uh, you can master cell structure design on your own. But this is the basic, as Corrado said, this is the basic idea. If you turn every cell in the periphery into a mini company with all the functions that it needs to serve external clients, so that becomes highly autonomous. Mm -hmm. and then you have some of the boring stuff like accounting, some IT services in an industrial organization like Toyota, for example. Of course, the periphery would be, yeah, let's let's not talk Toyota, let's talk about something simpler, simpler model, handles bike. It has branches in the periphery. Yeah. But of course, these branches cannot do their own accounting fully. They need IT systems. So they need to be serviced. Sometimes they need legal support. They need to be serviced by the center. But every branch in the periphery highly, uh, is highly autonomous and they have their own profit and loss statement, which is typical for decentralized organizations. You need a profit and loss uh, statement for every cell in the cell. Yeah. Sorry, wow. but this is exactly my provocation where it comes. You say that we have a cell for sales and then we have a sale, a cell for building. No. Every cell needs 
every cell in the periphery will sell and service if it's handles bucket, for example. They sell something, they service, they charge, they, I mean, they invoice their clients, they must do business development and marketing, they must do all the shit that usually you have divided. Yeah. In, in handles bucket, for example, there are no business units. An organization here gets rid of its business units, its business, business units head. Usually it gets rid of, rid of a good chunk of HR too, which is a good thing, isn't it? I think you understand what, what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, but get back to the Toyota example, okay? Exactly. You, you have the shop and then you have the team in Japan or elsewhere that is building the car. They are not connected. They are different cells in my mind, not the same cell. Look, let's not come, uh, the, 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 the Toyota, to, uh, to discuss Toyota, we need an additional session. Okay, oh, so yeah. we can make it next year. <laughs> yes, of course we can make it. But but then again, I am more interested, you know, the, we don't have to solve Toyota's problem because Toyota already solved it. No, 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 no. Oh, no your organization, your clients. Yeah. So, and, and of course, it's fascinating to look at Toyota, how it works. For example, for a long time, I couldn't figure out how this model applied to an airline. I just couldn't figure it out. And then I, at some point, 10 years ago, so we had an airline client. And when they talked and talked and how they had conflicts internally, it dawned on me that, and this is a very important insight. Every organization secretly is already, has this kind of structure. Every organizational, but it's, it's buried deep down. It's not at all visible in the org chart, which looks like this shit, right? So buried beneath the layers of command and control stupidity, every organization already functions like this. For example, an airline, it has stations. Stations like Munich Airport, Frankfurt, Denver, Dallas, yeah? So stations are part of this structure. And you have crews, but of course, not in the airline industry, if you ask, Crews, no, no, we have pilots and we have cabin personnel. We don't have crews. That's where the fuck up starts. You know, you divide the organization into functional divisions and then you have a head of crews and a head of pilots and a head of whatever service and head of, head of product management and you have an alpha organization. So the trick is to reintegrate these functions into cells so that you can decentralize. It's not an easy... Philosophically, or in terms of thinking, that's one of the biggest challenges in getting to beta. The rest is not so difficult. Okay. With the nice things. Okay. Okay. Topics. Yeah. Of course, we cannot clarify everything today. No, no, but again, this is uh, the situation that we want to create to provoke people to think about it, and so just to challenge their the mindset. Okay. And I have a secret agenda, agenda too. I want you to join this movement. I want you to use beta. I want you to appropriate beta. I want you to use the, the transformation approach. You don't have to buy the book, but the book comes handy, you know, to, so that your client can learn about. I want you to get into it, think about it, you know, and clarify your doubts that you will probably have after this session of 90 minutes that might have been thought of. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, exactly. I'm cautious of time. So we have just a few minutes to 7.30. So I think that uh, if you have some question, if any of you have some question, I think this is the right uh, moment to yes. ask. Yes. Um, the, the model that uh, Niels was proposing, in my opinion, is pretty clear. I mean, at, at least the idea behind the model. Yeah, the sketches. Yeah, the sketches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. Okay, we have just the first question from Richard. Please, Richard, unmute. And... Uh, hey, Niels. Um, I've been looking at your work on and off for, you know, for quite a few years, and I can see a lot of the attractions. But as somebody probably, you can probably gather I'm not in my first flush of youth, as somebody who came out of the sort of alternative collectivist movement in the 1960s and 70s, um, I also have my doubts. And in particular, it's my question is in there, which was that that was sort of driven by you know idea of small scale change. Um, and groups of people working together, but most of the energy went on infighting between the groups, actually, rather than changing the world. So, in uh, you know, in your model, you know, let's say you've got your two cells on the outside. One cell is talking to one group of customers who are saying we want X, and another cell is talking to a different group of customers who say we want Y, and 
um, there's one bit of the, there's a cell inside the center that can do either X or Y, but it can't do both. How do you, how do you avoid the situation where you end up spending most of your time arguing um, rather than actually generating value? Yes. What kind of movements are you thinking of with the bickering? Um, it was in the social change, you know, um, you know, youth projects and um, you know, working with the homeless and all of those sorts of things. Yes. For, when, when, you, when you talked about it, I was reminded of the empowerment movement from the 1990s. Empowerment was a big thing at the time. Okay, I've not heard of that, but... Um, those, um, those movements, most of them were about empowering individuals. Right now, we are also seeing this kind of stuff creeping back. Uh, oh, the individual person, all this purpose shit, it's about empowering the individual. And do what you want, however you want. But that is what the French call laissez-faire. And it's hocus pocus also. Yeah? That it's not at all what we are proposing here. What we are proposing here, and this is based on socio-technical systems from the 1970s and 80s. So this has a long research history, okay? We go a long way back. Russell Eckhoff and Eric Trist and so on. You know. Kurt Levine even is, is part of the, the scientific history of this. The, the, what you're, you were wondering about, oh, how can, this, how can this be consistent, coherent, and disciplined? And the secret sauce is teams. By the way, most contemporary concepts in the agile sphere, or many of them, do not understand teams. But the team is the small, in, in, in complex systems, Organizing organizations, which are concepts, complex systems. The smallest unit of value creation is the team. There is no smaller unit of value creation, which means individuals cannot produce, they, you cannot perform. You cannot produce value on your own. You are always codependent. You are dependent on others creating value with each other for each other. That's the concept of teams. Now, this is multi-teams, okay? One cell, two cell, and every cell has one team, right? Team one, two, three, and they are all business teams because they are in the periphery. And then they sell their services to an external client and are paid in return. So they can have a profit and loss statement. Now, the periphery cannot do everything by themselves. So they sell services to the center and are paid by the center for their services. Uh, no, they must pay the, uh, the, other, the other way around. The center. Exactly. Sorry, sorry. Ah! So they, the, the center gets paid for their services and it must break even while the periphery can earn and should earn a profit, a decent profit organization. This is market economics added on, added on the social stuff. This is not just about social stuff. This is about building a market economy inside an organization, which is why in this kind of organization, you cannot have budgeting or allocations or cost management. Toyota does not have cost management, believe it or not. They do not have allocations, you know, financial controllers steering everything. They do not even know the concept of fixed cost. If you have this kind of model, the notion of fixed cost goes away. You still have capital, you still have capital, but you do not have fixed cost. Uh, so the discipline in this model comes from marrying the social with economics, so to speak. This is highly market economy driven, while any alpha organization is ultimately like Soviet-style um, uh, centralized planning, right? It's very Sovietic, really, which so, doesn't work. How do you, in terms of those, um, the two that you've got at the bottom there that you were drawing, um, when they each want something different from the one that, they, you've, that they're linked to in the center, is that just resolved by the, the center one saying, I'm going to make more money by doing X, for um, team A, then I'm going to make from, you know, is it? And this, div uh, great question. This, this is different from industry to industry, but if uh, in any company, it would be this way. Every cell in the periphery owns a portfolio of clients. It might be just one client or a large number of clients, a lot of clients, yeah? And if a company, for example, has 100 millions of sales, <laughs> and it has a hundred cells in the periphery, every cell must do approximately one million of sales, you know, and business and charge a hundred million in, it must invoice a hundred million of sales to external customers. So this model means 
the periphery owns the clients, the periphery, it might be projects or products or services, whatever it is, yeah, the periphery owns the business, and if, if this team, for example, for some reason cannot serve a certain client, it might communicate about an inquiry with another, they, sales can collaborate as well, voluntarily, because the product needs us, they can collaborate, but there is no steering from the center, no centralized coordination. The coordination is done as in any decent democracy. It's done between independent actors or interdependent actors. Does this answer the question? The discipline comes from the boundary, which must have principles. It comes from financial accountability, which comes through profit and loss statements for every team. High levels of transparency. Toyota, Handelsbank, and Southwest Airlines, Aldi, DM, they all have highest levels of transparency. Even Bullsorg, a healthcare organization, they copied Handelsbank's model, which is exactly what I'm explaining to you here. Exactly the same. With the profit and loss statements for the sales and so on. And that the center sells to the periphery. Yeah. This is how it works. A couple of additional things you need to think about, but this is basically the, the, the working. Market economy, very simple, very effective. Yeah. We have one more question, uh, at least two, I would say, in the chat. Daniel, if you want to make your question, and then Rene. Sure. Hey, uh, Nils, maybe you can talk a little bit more or in depth on the difference between uh, system optimization and uh, overcoming the system. I, yes. I think you, Beautiful. We had Why are you mentioning this? Yes, I'm interested in the, the both terms. and, and Yes. How this Oh, you got this. Where did you get this idea? This is beautiful that you're mentioning this. This is from the Weichselbaum book that is only available in German. Uh, Ernst Weichselbaum, he, he created his own lean philosophy over the last 40 years of 40 years of work. He created his own philosophy of lean, so to speak, his own philosophy of beta. And he came up with this important distinction. Again, two, two opposed ideas. Optimization of a system, you can optimize a system or you can overcome a system. If we are talking about alpha and beta, what I have tried to, this is a nice way to sum up our, our session today. What I tried to preach to you, but I'm not trying to preach you or convince you, of course, but uh, <laughs> I'm a preacher a little bit, right? I cannot totally do it. Sorry, sorry for that. Christina is, is nodding her head. This is, Christina's nodding is enough of punishment for me tonight. It's okay. It's okay. I deserve it. But I'm really just trying to make you think. And of course, Daniel is raising this beautiful topic here, optimization versus over optimizing a system, overcoming a system. Sadly, the agile industrial complex has tried to make its money, its bucks just on optimization. The problem is that most organizations are alpha today. Few are beta organizations like Toyota, right? So here's the problem. Almost all organizations are still stuck in command and control. What, do we want to be agile? Yes, agile is great. But to do agile, we must overcome the system. It's not enough to optimize command and control with a little bit of safe, you know, spending 40 million bucks on safe, which will never work. Yeah? Spending 20 million per year on agile coaches, it will never overcome the system to do this. That is just maintenance of a flawed model. You can do it, but you will never get the whole of. Here you might, might reap 20% of the potential of Scrum and Agile stuff. Here you can reap 10,000% of improvement. And don't get me wrong, I've seen this kind of improvement happening. You can see it at Toyota every day competing with Volkswagen. The performance difference is not just a few bucks of shareholder value or return. It is happiness. It is effectiveness. It is to save the planet uh, kind of benefits, you know? Beta organizations can improve much, much more because they make good use of 100% potentially of people's brains. If alpha organizations can only use maybe 10% of people's brains because they are top-down command and control and so on. So optimizing a system is very important. Also for Toyota, by the way, that is what they call Kanban. Ah, Kaizen, for example. Yeah? Optimizing the system, it's mostly, mostly Kaizen. Yeah? They do not have, sometimes they have to overcome their system as well, but basically they have a good model. So yeah, lots of Kaizen is optimizing their good model, yeah? but 
it's, it's not enough to optimize alpha. If you are in, if you are stuck in alpha and improve, you are improving planning every year, you're still fucked. Yeah. So this is uh, Daniel is opening the door here for me to mention. I think uh, uh, we need currently to make agile happen in the world, to make more agility happen in the world. We have to spice up this. We have to continue the good work of optimization, okay, but we have to learn finally to overcome the system. And for that, we need to learn organizational development, organizational transformation, which is why I would recommend you to learn open space beta. Currently, the best way to overcome the shitty system of alpha and get to beta in just 90 days. Daniel, you wanted me to do this, right? Yeah, and it's just a quick uh, jumping in. Maru is asking to spell the name of the German person, the German uh, writers that you mentioned. Ah, yeah, Mr. Ernst Weichselbaum. 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 It's a Jewish name, of course. He's an Austrian, and uh, I published, I, I edited his book. If you want, if you are, if you if you like the book later on and want to translate it into English or Spanish or any other, language, uh, can you repeat it. also the name of the book, please? Yeah, it's only available in can, uh, Daniel. Uh, can just you, in German, not in English. Okay. Daniel, maybe can copy the link to the book into the chat. Okay. Oh, yeah, we can thank all read you. German, right? We can all learn to read German. Yes, it's a very good book, by the way. Kein problem. Kein problem. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's. I say it's, but don't believe in what I'm saying. It's the best lean book ever published. No less. In Germany. <laughs> so far, only in German. But if you are. If you have good connections with a publisher, they should publish it in English. It's just brilliant. It's just fantastic. Okay, thank you. Rene, make your question, please. Um, yeah. Um, our, our circle here has shrunk a little bit, but that's okay, right? You can drop out at yeah, a I'll, time. I'll, I'll just want to have a, a bit of a double check, uh, okay. if I understood you correctly. Yes. So when you were explaining the the cells and that they, they you know the periphery have they they carry a profit and loss accountability yes. and they do charge internal services or they they are pay for internal services from yes. the more core. Yes. Um, center. Center. From the from the center from the other uh, uh, cells. Yes. Um, so. One, one of the things in my organization, they have big words about transformation and whatever, um, but they still have a very traditional budgeting and prioritization cycle. So what I'm lobbying for is that first, no vertical organization, but value streams and every value stream should have its own budget. It's not it's not entirely going to the decentralized, but at least I'm trying to get some people to think about it totally differently than just, oh, this is a product and this product has a profit and loss and this product has a different product. You know, it's all organized vertically. So would that be a stepping stone in the right direction to get defined value streams with defined budget per value stream? Yeah, value, the idea of value streams is, is this, you have a functionally divided organization and you create a stream, it's called, it's called process management or matrix yeah. organization, there are so many, but they are all about optimizing. Optimizing their system, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And optimizing functional division. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and what you should, th this is why the idea of beyond budgeting was so explosive 20 years ago, it's still, it's still explosive. Let go of the budget. Let's go of vertical. Let's go of the sales function and the functional division. Like what we did, for example, some of you might do, might be doing Scrum, right? And mm -hmm. at least to get a Scrum team going, you need to reintegrate functions. Maybe to, you know get the architecture part and the software coding part and the testing and whatever you know DevOps style and so on. You must reintegrate different functions that you might in waterfall, you might divide them into mm -hmm. different departments. Yeah. You have to reintegrate this. The same can be done in organizations. I think the main problem for pe people like myself or Rene is, okay, if we if you want to do that, if you want to sell transformation, you must sell it, you must start talking to managers or the CEO, right? Yeah, and, and it's like the I, elephant I, in the room, maybe. I understand that you know you are posing a, a pretty radical idea. 
but I'm just trying to, and I, I can get there. Yes. But what are the stepping stones? Do we, can we define any intermediate stepping stones that say, hey, you're going in the right direction, but you're not there yet. And that's what I'm, you know, trying to. Yes, a stepping stone. Here's one. I don't want you to go to sleep unhappy. I wow. love you guys. So I like you. So <laughs> I have to offer something practical. Here's the thing. Don't add on top. My suggestion is organizational hygiene. Suggest something to be killed. Here, here are two reasons. Killing stupid stuff like budgeting or killing a certain department and reuniting that function into. For example, to make scrum teams happen, we should all have killed product management as a function, right? As a standalone for product uh, function. You cannot have product managers, powerful product managers, and have a PO. It's impossible. But most organizations haven't eliminated the fucking project, product management function, so it's still all fucko. Yeah? All right. You need org hygiene. You need to eliminate functions, processes, lazy tools, meetings. You can throw rules like travel policies. Throw the travel policy away. If you have influence on people, yeah, the travel policy must go. It, it, it's just a ludicrous thing. So you can cleanse your organization from the command and control bullshit and it will improve. You don't have to get to the CEO to do most of these things or many of these things. They can be done at all levels of an organization. So yes, if you only have one management client, you know, manager client who is not so high in the organization, still that person can do some organizational hygiene. You know, throw out the garbage, which includes, of course, OKRs, you know, and to tell people don't implement holacracy shit. It cannot work, you know, don't implement that shit. Don't, your organization will get dirty. You have to do organizational hygiene, not impl implement more stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. in eliminate indicators, measures, reports. Yeah. So organizational hygiene, everyone can do it like, it's like pushing, uh, brushing your teeth. Yeah, it, it, it comes down to this, um, this value, right? Just trust your people. You don't. You don't need. You don't need indicators. Trust your people. You yeah, know? but uh, I would say. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't say that. But you. We are different. We could work together as well. That's good, right? We frame the problem. I would not. I would never say that. I would say, start to trust the team, and measure team performance. But mm -hmm. fuck individual indicators. Individual measurement is always crap. So for example, performance appraisal. Every client that you might have participates, most of them participate or do performance appraisal. Tell them that they should stop doing it. That's organizational hygiene. Even if the company, don't do it. Don't do performance appraisal because that is blaming individual people for their performance, and et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, there are different ways of approaching this. Renee, we don't have to agree on everything, but uh, <laughs> this is my suggestion. This is for everyone. And plus, if yeah. this works, it might also wash you up to the top of the hierarchy so that you can talk about actual overcoming the alpha system, actual transformation. So if you start with organizational hygiene, this might, I will use a terrible word, scale into doing something more. Of course, it doesn't scale, but it, it will lead you to doing more and be more fond, more acknowledged for you know transformation stuff. It's a way of working yourself up the hierarchical ladder to a client that can say, yes, I need to transform. We need to transform. We need, we need beta. So tell people about beta. That's the most, the radical people. The thing is tell people about beta, tell about beta and start helping people to do organizational hygiene or do it for yourself in your scope of sphere of influence. Thank you, Nias. Okay, I think that uh, we have 10 minutes to, to wait. Uh, I think this has do. been a long thing, right? Like an yeah. over, uh, too long a movie and so on. Oh, exhausted. Yeah. I must pee as well. You help me from peeing. No, yeah, it was wonderful. I, Thank you for all this exchange, all these questions. But actually, it was a great session, is because it was so interactive with people making questions and sharing observation. Yeah. Uh, so I think it was really great, just as the last session of the year. So many thanks for uh, for sharing. Um, I have put in the chat the link to the LinkedIn uh, group where we can continue the conversation. So you are invited to join the group 
and make your question there. Niels is already a member of that group, so can see your uh, observation notes and what else. So we can continue there. And uh, so thank you everyone for joining clearly and, and also for being so proactive and making part of uh, the success of this session. Um, before closing an invitation, if you want to share something, and I saw in the chat some ideas about creating a round tables or something like that, please let me know and uh, I will be happy to create another event following this one or on another topic. Um, keep in mind that a living community is a community where actually all the members of the community are participating in creating value. So we, we want great speakers, but also we want our members to be speakers in our event. So you are invited to contact me on LinkedIn or on Meetup. Again, thank you, Niels. The last word to you about uh, the, the, the greetings. Yes, well, the last word. Please join the movement. Let's join the movement. Let's not let's not just feed the agile industrial complex. Like let's talk about the alternative, the systemic alternative of beta. And uh, I think we it might seem impossible now. The challenge to transform organizations might seem grandiose or big now. But um, actually, big change does not even exist. If you look at my work and papers, you will see that I don't believe. I don't even believe in transformation because everything that we do like having this meetup is transformative in its own right. And um, we can we can finally make this wide, more widespread transformation. I'm using the word again for lack of another word. We can make this transformation to this kind of organization, more decentralized, more self-organized and much more democratic. We can certainly make it happen now that we have the tools, the methods. The, and I think also the we, we, we know the potential of agile and agility. So I think now more confidently, we can strive more confidently for transforming entire organizations. So thank you for, for this conversation. It was lovely. Yeah. Amazing. So let me stop the recording so we can close the session. Yeah.